And welcome to the first President's Research Council meeting um, of the new academic year at UT Southwestern. Tonight's featured speaker, who is James, um, Dr. James Bugrolas, or Jim, as we know him. Jim obtained his MD from the University of Navarra in Spain. Then he obtained his PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He did his um, internship and residency in medicine at Duke University, returned to Boston to do a fellowship in adult oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the Massachusetts General Hospital. His postdoctoral research was also done in Boston um, in the laboratory of Bill Kalin, who's one of the greats of molecular oncology. Jim joined the UT Southwestern faculty in 2006, and since then he's built an absolutely fantastic bench-to-bedside program that combines creative research in the laboratory with outstanding clinical care um, at the hospital or in the hospital, and in particular, the treatment of patients with kidney cancer. In the laboratory, Jim has discovered new genes that cause kidney cancer, and in a very exciting recent um, series of studies that I believe he will touch on this evening, he and his team have developed a new drug um, that, at least in early clinical trials, is proving to be a real game changer in the treatment of advanced kidney cancer. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. James Bugarolis. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about kidney cancer. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a perspective. And I, hopefully my accent would not get in the way. I realize I have a thick accent, and I apologize for that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history and also the history of the kidney cancer program and the new discoveries. And I'm going to share with you some stories about, about some of my patients, some of them good, some of them, as you will see, not uh, so good. So as uh, you heard from Dr. Russell, I grew up in Spain and I went to the University of Navarra, but I was actually born in New York. <laughs> my father is an oncologist who came to the U.S. to do his training. In fact, he was the first oncologist in Spain. And I had the privilege, after I got my medical degree, to go to Boston, where I was at MIT for graduate school. And as you heard, then I went to Duke, and then back to Boston, where I was at the Dana Farber and Harvard Medical School, and then eventually to UT Southwestern. So at UT Southwestern, I came in to start my laboratory. And this was the letter that I got from Dr. Fitz. And I was tasked to uh, starting a program as a physician scientist focusing on cellular mechanisms of kidney cancer. Now, an important event in the history is the founding of the kidney cancer program. I will tell you about that today. This is the letter that I also received from Dr. Fitz. Uh, we are most enthusiastic about your vision for developing a program of excellence at UT Southwestern to advance our understanding of renal cancer and translate discoveries into improvements in patient care and we're gonna establish a kidney cancer program. That was my goal from the day I came, and it was a very exciting time. So my laboratory, the mission of my laboratory is to understand how kidney cancer develops at the molecular level, to translate these findings into new treatments, and to train the next generation of physician scientists. Why do we need research? Well, this is why we need research. This is Whitney. Whitney was a patient of mine. Her parents are here. Um, they um, allowed me to share with you her story. So this is when Whitney came in, and I'm dedicating this presentation to her. So this is Whitney's brain. You can see her eyes, her nose. She came in on July 11, 2014. And what you can see here are four brain metastases, causing a substantial amount of swelling in her brain. She had nine brain metastasis. In 12 days, and this is the time that it took to do brain surgery, I should say radio surgery, which is different, the metastasis had actually grown in size. This was one of the most aggressive tumors that I have encountered. When she was two, Whitney was diagnosed with life-threatening stage four neuroblastoma. She had surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, and was fortunate to make it. When she came to see me, she was 28. She had extensive metastases to the brain, the mediastinum, which sits between the lungs, the liver, the adrenal gland, and elsewhere. 
she had an unusual form of kidney cancer. For this type of patients, the median life expectancy, so patients that have more than one brain metastasis, is 7.9 months. And most patients get through two lines of therapy. Only a small minority will get through a third line of therapy. This is data actually from Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is a big cancer center in New York. And as you can see based on the date, this is a fairly current series. So she had brain radiosurgery. She was the first patient with brain metastasis to whom we offered high dose IL-2. This is the only potentially curative treatment we have available for, for patients with metastatic kidney cancer. And, and we had never done it for patients with brain metastasis. But Dr. Miki, who is one of our neurosurgeons, agreed to be on call so that we could offer this to, to Whitney. She developed additional brain metastasis, too many to count. So while she was with me, we were able to get her through four lines of therapy, but I got her three months over the median life expectancy. So I wasn't able to get for her very much. So this is why we need research. And I'm gonna share with you something else. This is uh, actually um, something that uh, I received from Whitney at the turn of the year. Dr. B, I wanted to thank you for all that you have done for me. The past few months have been scary at times and filled with lots of unknowns, but you have been there every step of the way. Throughout, this crazy journey has taught me a lot about myself and other people. I am entitled to feel how I want to feel, but I am also stronger than I think. I keep recalling what you said to me at my last appointment, and that was to embrace and make the most out of each and every moment. It is easier said than done, but it's something I should have been doing all along. I want to defy the odds and prove that I won't be a part of a statistic or percentage. I have always been and will continue to be different. Something else I have observed along the way is how kind and compassionate people are. I believe we are on this earth to help and love each other, and I have definitely experienced this. It takes a special type of person to do what you do on a daily basis. I am grateful for you and hope 2015 brings you and your family peace, love, and joy with you. This is why we need research. The state of affairs is not, it's not fair. Where did the problem start for Whitney? So we think the problem started in the kidneys Kidneys are the organs in the body that are responsible for cleaning the blood from harmful toxins. Kidney cancer is the seventh most common cancer type in men and the ninth or tenth most common cancer type in women. What you can see here is a CAT scan. You may have seen this before. You can imagine the patient is lying on his back. So this is actually the left side and this is the right side. This is the liver, this is the normal kidney, this is a kidney tumor. Most patients today present with no symptoms. This is something that is found when they have a CAT scan for another reason. So as you can see, this tumor was not a small tumor, three or four times the size on this plane of the normal kidney. When kidney cancer grows, it invades the blood vessels and it metastasizes. The most common place of metastasis is the lungs. You can see here a lung metastasis. It also goes to the bone, and this is a problem, because when cancer gets to the bone, it can fracture. It can lead to fractures. You can also see a metastasis in the liver, where it also commonly goes, and unfortunately, it also goes to the brain. And when it gets to the brain, it can cause seizures and other significant problems. Now, there has been a lot of progress in kidney cancer. And this is actually the reason why I decided to, to work on kidney cancer. In other words, when I was in training, which is uh, this period of time, uh, there, there was only one treatment available, and that was high-dose IL-2. It is a very toxic treatment that is given in an intensive care unit setting. Since then, there has been significant problems. You can see here seven new treatments that have been approved, some of them to, to whom we contributed. What is at the root of the progress? At the root of the progress is an understanding of the biology. So this is a cartoon. Uh, taken from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is an editorial I had the privilege to write. This is the premier medical journal. Uh, and this is from 2007. And it illustrates the pathways 
that are deregulated in normal cells of the kidney so that they become cancer cells. And there are two fundamental pathways. There is this pathway, which is governed by this gene that we call von Hippel-Lindau, and there is this other pathway, which is governed by this gene that encodes mammalian target of rapamycin. And where the discovery is that these two pathways are implicated in kidney cancer that led to the new treatments. You have this drug, this means that the drug interferes with the process. So this drug, Bevacizumab, blocks this growth factor. These four drugs block these growth factor receptors. These two drugs block this uh, other protein. So it was an understanding of the biology that identified targets for drug development. And that's where we think the future lies. However, these drugs do not cure patients. They just slow the growth of the cancer. So there are, have, we have there is a lot for us that remains to be done. So I'm going to tell you another story. This is a, a more positive story. This was also a young patient, 24 years old. This patient had familial tuberous sclerosis complex, which he inherited from his father. And he presented with a CAT scan like this. OK, you can see this is the left kidney, which is a little abnormal, but now you can see this mass over here, which is taking, in fact, most of his abdomen, okay? So this was an unusual tumor. It was an epithelial angiomyolipoma. We can look at the cells under the microscope. These cells are very abnormal. You can see these very large cells. And this, this component here, we call the nucleus. And so five months earlier, this individual had had the right kidney removed. They thought he had an abscess. And during the surgery, which was done elsewhere, the tumor is spilled. But as you can see, in five months, we've gone from something that was a microscopic spillage to a tumor that is the size is bigger than a softball. So he came here, he was profusely bleeding, and in fact, he was to near exsanguination levels. He received seven units of blood and was requiring weekly transfusions thereafter. There was an attempt to, to block the blood vessels that were feeding the tumor, but that attempt failed, so he was continuing to bleed. Because the bowel was compressed, he was unable to take anything by mouth. He would throw everything out. Right? Normally, the bowel takes up most of the abdomen. In his case, it was the tumor that was taking up most of his abdomen. So he started intravenous nutrition, and the patient was very deconditioned. Like Whitney, this is somebody that has a very unusual tumor. It's an epithelial angiomyolipoma. This is not your typical kidney cancer. So what were these patient's options? Well, the surgeons said, this is not something we can take out. The oncologist, my colleagues who were seeing the patient at St. Paul Hospital at that time said, this is a rare tumor, we don't have any treatments. So the, the recommendation was actually for the patient to go to hospice, 24 years old. Now, this patient had tuberous sclerosis complex. So we knew that he had a disease where these genes, the TSC1 and the TSC2 genes, were dysfunctional. And these genes encode proteins that are inside the cell. And these proteins are important in the regulation of this complex, which we refer to as mTOR complex 1. So in his case, we speculated that the tumor had lost the function of this complex. And as a result, there was increased activity of this other complex, which was leading to the development of the tumor. As it turns out, we have a drug that interferes with this process. It's called serolimus. And this is a drug, actually, that is approved as an immunosuppressant, not a cancer drug, a drug that suppresses the immune system in patients that have gotten kidney transplants. So because I'm familiar with this pathway, I was asked to get involved in the case. So I went in, talked to the patient, told them, well, we have this drug available. The drug would be expected to neutralize the effect of the genetic defect. And maybe it's worth trying. Your alternative is not good. There was no literature, nothing that we knew that was going to work for this patient. And nobody had tried this before. So we started serolimus, and this is when the patient came in. His hemoglobin, which is a measure of the amount of red blood cells in the blood, was below the limit of what we can print in our electronic medical record. He got seven units of blood. 
And as you can see, he continued to require blood transfusions. The, the attempt to block the blood vessels failed. And then he started serolimus. And as you can see, his blood counts normalized. He only required one more transfusion. That is scan that I showed you compares now to this scan. That's from February 2009. This is from April of 2013. You can see the tumor, which was huge, got much smaller. But unfortunately, the surgeons still felt it was very attached to the liver and they couldn't resect it. And a second tumor started growing. But this is an individual that was going to be sent to hospice six years ago. So this was a relative success. It was obviously not a complete success because we were not able to cure the patients. But what were the keys? First, we understood the genes. We knew what was driving the kidney cancer. It was those TSC1 and TSC2 genes. Secondly, we had an understanding of the pathways. We knew how the mutations in those genes were, was affecting cellular signaling processes so that the cancer would develop. And third, we had a drug that could interfere with the process. So if we want to cure cancer, this is where we need to start. And this is actually the foundation for the program in my laboratory. So this is where we want to get to, personalized medicine. We need to start by understanding what genes are driving the cancer process, figuring out, figuring out how the genes affect cellular signaling pathways, and garnering that knowledge for the development of drugs. That's not enough. We also need better models where we can test these drugs. And we need biomarkers. We use the biomarkers to determine whether a particular gene is activated or inactivated in a cancer. And finally, clinical trials. So this is the program that I set out to develop when I came to UT Southwestern in 2006. And we've made progress. These are different publications that we have published in the different areas. And I'm just going to share with you some of the findings from the laboratory. So this, I showed you this slide previously. So how are we going to go forward? Well, we need two things. We need new targets, and we need new pathways. And these are the two stories that I'm going to share with you. So with respect to new targets, the target that you're going to hear about today is, is this hypoxia-inducible factor. Now, interestingly enough, this factor is made up of two different proteins, HIF-2 alpha and HIF-1 beta, which come together to have a functional transcription factor. And the important protein in the partner is HIF-2 alpha. And HIF-2 alpha was actually discovered by none other than Dr. Russell. So Dr. Russell and McKnight were actually the discoveries, the discoveries of the HIF-2 alpha gene, which uh, lies the foundation for the story that I'm going to tell you. So we think this is the most important protein in, in this type of kidney cancer, which is clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And I put a little crown for you. <laughs> and as I said, uh, this protein is a partner. It, it has two different partners. It's, it's what we call a dimer. So this uh, uh, research that was done by Kevin Garner and Rick Bruick at UT Southwestern established that the HIF-2 alpha subunit, and this is the HIF-1 beta subunit, had a hole. And we do not typically see holes inside of proteins. But when they did the structure, they found that there was a hole. Now, a lot of people would have looked at that and said, well, what can I do with that? But they thought, what if that hole could actually be accessed from the outside? What if we could get something inside the hole that could change the structure of the protein and thereby kill the function of the protein. And this protein belongs to a class of proteins that are referred to as transcription factors that are traditionally considered undruggable. These are proteins that, that cannot be drugged. But these guys thought, well, let's see whether we can exploit that. And indeed, uh, they did a screen and they found candidate uh, chemicals that fit into the hole and disrupted the surface of the protein so that the two proteins came apart. And when that happens, uh, HIF2 is no longer active. Okay, you have an inactive complex. So uh, this is just shown in a, in a different diagram form here. So this is the HIF2 alpha partner. This is the HIF1 beta partner. And in this particular domain, the pass B domain, that was the hole that they identified. And um, you can see here, this is the structure of the protein. This is one subunit, this is the other subunit. And the hole here is depicted in red. 
they uh, leverage the high throughput screening facility we have at UT Southwestern to identify chemicals that would fit within this hole. And that led, that was a successful screen and led to the identification of several chemicals that had the ability to get in the hole and split the two components apart. That actually led to the founding of a company that's Peloton Therapeutics, which is in the UT Southwestern Biocenter across from the street. And Peloton Therapeutics has gone on to generating a drug, a drug that is now in clinical trials. Now, we have a drug. How do we determine whether this drug is active against kidney cancer? Well, the way we do that in my laboratory is we take the drug and we study it in mice that have been implanted with human kidney cancer. So these are patients who have donated uh, their cancer, who have had surgery, and we take their tumors and we put them into the kidney of the mouse. And we've asked in the past, so this is essentially what involves. Somebody comes to, to the hospital, they have a tumor in their kidney, they have a resection of the, oftentimes, the kidney with the tumor, they donate the tumor to us, and then we take the tumor and we put it in the kidney of the mouse. And we ask, do these tumors reproduce the appearance, the gene expression, the genetic alterations, the DNA copy number alterations, which is a different form of genetic alteration and the treatment responsiveness. And what we found is that the answer was yes for all of these questions. And remember that the tumor in the mouse is not mouse cancer, it's in fact human cancer. So this is what the process looks like, and this is Andrea who's been championing this for the last four years. So the mouse gets anesthetized, the kidney gets pulled out, and then the tumor is put in. And I don't know how well you can see this, but the, the tumor is under the kidney capsule. And then when it grows, it looks like this. You can see the normal mouse kidney for comparison is very small, about one centimeter in size. And you can see here this human kidney cancer growing in the mouse kidney. Interestingly enough, and we've actually generated 70 of these lines. Interestingly enough, the tumor in the kidney of the mouse remembers the patient that it came from. So this is actually shown here, this in a diagra diagram version, but in a more schematic version, you can see here. So each of these mice represents a tumor from a patient that was passage from one mouse to the next mouse and so on and so forth. And whenever you see the mouse next to the patient, it means that the tumor in the patient was more similar to the tumor in the mouse than the tumor in this patient compared to that patient. So what we've done here is what is called unsupervised hierarchical clustering of gene expression. So we take, if you want, the sum of all the genes that are turned on and off in the cancer, and we ask, how similar is this tumor to the rest of the tumors in the group? And as you can see, in the majority of instances, not everybody, the tumors in the mouse cluster with the tumors in the particular patient. So that mouse that was implanted with a tumor from this patient knew that this tumor was coming from this patient. And when we did this analysis, it clustered back to that patient. So using this platform, we have tested this new drug, this HIV-2 inhibitor. And what we do is, so I told you, we typically put those tumors in the kidney of the mouse. But when we do these drug trials, we take the tumor from the kidney, we put it under the skin, where we can easily take measurements. Okay, so we let the tumor grow, and then once we can start taking measurements, then we treat the mice. And the mice get treated with vehicle, which is, uh, if you want, what's used to solubilize the drug, get treated with the drug, and then we use another drug that we use in the clinic as a control. And I'm just going to show you here an example. So this is one particular line, XP164. You can see the tumor that is getting the vehicle is growing fairly substantially over the course of a month. Right, so it's going many times doubling in size. This is the tumor, the same cohort of tumors that were treated with sunitinib. This is one of the drugs that we have available in the clinic. And you can see in each of these curves represents three or four mice, okay? So this is stabilized the cancer. Now this new drug, this HIF2 inhibitor, as you can see, decreased the size of the tumors and it was working even better than this sunitinib drug that we have approved for kidney cancer treatment. And this is the size of the tumors uh, of the mice that were untreated. These are the mice that were treated with this drug that we have available. And these are the size of the tumors of the mice that were treated with this new drug. So we've done this in 18 different patient cohorts. Okay? 
And we found that there was responsiveness in 14 out of the 18, which is 78%. And in fact, there was complete suppression, like you can see, you can see here, in 55% of the cohort. And these involve about 200 mice. So these experiments are largest scale experiments with mice. So I'm going now switch and tell you another story. And again, I have permission to share this with you. This is Richard's story. So he was diagnosed with kidney cancer in 2008 at age 40. That's uncommon. Most patients with kidney cancer present in their 50s or 60s. A few months, so he had surgery with removal of the primary tumor, but a few months later he had metastases that were found in the abdomen. The life expectancy for patients with clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which is the most common type of kidney cancer, and I abbreviated as CCRCC, with one poor prognostic factor, like he did, is 27 months. And as you can see, this is also fairly contemporaneous data. Fewer than 20% of the patients receive three or more drugs. So Richard, under my care, received seven lines of therapy. So essentially, he received every non-redundant treatment that is available today for kidney cancer patients. Each treatment controlled his cancer for about six to eight months. But at the stage where we were, he was running out of options. Turns out that Richard had donated his cancer when he had one of his surgeries. And we had tested this HIF2 inhibitor in Richard's cancer. And this is what we found. As you can see, the tumor untreated was growing very substantially, but with the treatment, the tumor was stabilized. So this drug has now gotten to phase one clinical trials, which we have uh, open here at UT Southwestern. And I approached Richard and I said, well, you know, this may be something that you can try. He was the first patient in Texas to receive this medication and one of three patients who did receive this medication at the particular dose level. And these were his scans. He's now been on this medication for about 130 days, but the scans look quite good. You can see that the metastasis in the liver remains stable, the metastasis in the kidney remains stable, and a metastasis that he had in the pelvis remains stable. This is not a home run, but everything counts. So Richard has now been treated for metastatic kidney cancer for six and a half, six and a half years and counting. He's been able to do a lot of things. This is a picture of Richard. When he was diagnosed, you can see he was not very happy. And he's been able to see his children grow up. And we hope to be able to continue this. So we are now tackling a number of important questions with the HIF2 inhibitor. We want to find a biomarker so we can distinguish those patients that are likely to benefit from those patients that are unlikely to benefit. And in fact, we have several candidates. We have identified a vulnerability in those tumors that do not respond to the HIF2 inhibitor. So we think we have another mechanism to target those cancers. We have anticipated mechanisms of resistance that may develop in patients. So oftentimes with these molecularly targeted therapies, what happens is that the cancer cell will introduce changes to the target. And those changes will prevent the drug from binding. In fact, we discovered that that is the case with this drug. But that can lay the foundation for second generation inhibitors that take into account the presence of that alteration. We are in the process of looking at drug combinations and we're also planning additional clinical trials. So I told you that to uh, make progress, we needed two things. We need new targets. And I spoke to you about a new target, this HIF2, uh, this HIF2 complex. And we also need to identify new pathways. We, knew, we need new biological processes that are implicated in kidney cancer that we can target. This is work from the UK. The UK discovered another gene that is mutated in kidney cancer. It's called polybromo-1. This gene is mutated in 50% of clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So 50% of the patients with kidney cancer will have inactivation of this gene. Like the VHL gene that I mentioned, polybromo-1 represents an over-target, or the VHL HIF complex, and new therapies may emerge from understanding how polybromo-1 works. 
my laboratory discovered another gene that is mutated in kidney cancer. It's called BOP1. It's mutated at a much lower frequency, only in 15% of kidney cancer patients. But it also represents a novel target, and we hope that new, ther new therapies will emerge as we come to understand how BOP1 functions. Now, this is what's interesting about these two genes. What you're looking at here is a series of tumors from patients at UT Southwestern that we evaluated for mutations in BAP1 and PBRM1. So all of these tumors here in blue have mutations in PBRM1. And you can see these um, blue, blue changes in the second column. And these tumors over here have mutations in BAP1. And then we found three tumors that had mutations in both. Now, this raises an interesting question. So if PBRM1 mutations are 50% and BAP1 mutations are 15%, how many mutations would we, or how many tumors would we expect with mutations in both? Let's see if we have any accountants. <laughs> Who said 7%? That's the right answer. <laughs> so you multiply, right, the PBRM1 by the BAP1 mutations. And you would expect 7.5%, which is uh, 13 samples, and we only got three. So this tells us something fundamentally important about the biology. And when we did a statistics, we found that this was highly statistically significant. In other words, the probability that this occurred at random was three in 10,000, that order of magnitude. <coughs> Actually, yeah, three in 100,000. Thank you. So we've gone and we evaluated the studies. This is a study from the Beijing Genome Institute. This is a study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and this is a study from a national uh, consortium. And we pulled this, their, their numbers. So these are the number of tumors that had mutations in polybromo-1, the number of tumors that had mutations in BAB1, and the number of tumors that had mutations in both genes. And as you can see, and we calculated what was the expected double mutation frequency based on their detection mutation frequency. And in every case, we found that the number of expected mutation was higher than the number of identified mutations. And again, the, the probability of this was uh, statistically significant. So once again, a statistical analysis of publications by other centers suggests that for reasons we don't yet understand, these mutations in BAP1 and PRM1 don't like to be together. Now, we think this establishes the foundation for the first molecular genetic classification of kidney cancer. Before, all the kidney cancers were the same. Now, we think the kidney cancers come in four flavors. There are the kidney cancers that are deficient for polybromo-1. There are the kidney cancers that are deficient for BAB1. There are the kidney cancers that are deficient for both. And there are the kidney cancers that don't have mutations in either gene. And interestingly enough, we made another observation. We found that these tumors, when we look under the microscope, look a lot more aggressive than these tumors. So it turns out that these genes are all in the same chromosome. So DNA is arranged in chromosomes, OK? And genes are found in chromosomes. And in, this is chromosome 3 in a human. And it turns out that polybromo-1, BAB1, and the VHL gene, which is also mutated in kidney cancer, are all in the short term of chromosome 3. And this is in a region that is very often lost in cancer. So what you can see here is a diagram of chromosome 3 across many tumors. And when you see blue, it means there is loss. That is what we call as a deletion. So in the majority of, of kidney cancers, there is a loss of this region. And you may or may not remember that in, in every cell, there are two copies of every gene, OK? So this has led us to hypothesize the following model for the development of kidney cancer. So cells start with two copies of this chromosome, and they have two copies of each of the genes. And we think that the cancer starts with an, a mutation in the VHL gene. And this is followed by loss of the whole arm of the chromosome. And we think that at that point, if the cancer cell undergoes a mutation in BAP1, you are going to end up with a tumor of high grade. And if it undergoes a mutation in polybromo-1, you are going to end up with a tumor of a lower grade. So we believe we now have 
some understanding as to how kidney cancer develops. Obviously, we wanted to know more about these high-grade and low-grade tumors. Do they affect survival? Does this correlate with poor survival, and does this correlate with better survival? And this is work from Dr. Kapoor, who is the pathologist that I work with. So we collaborated with the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic has the largest um, um, bank of kidney cancer specimens, and these are from patients that they, that they have been following over the course of the last two decades. So we have a lot of data. So Dr. Kapoor developed a test, a test that we can use to very quickly determine whether the particular cancer has had a mutation in BAP1 or a mutation in polybromo one And we applied that test to the cohort of the 1,400 specimens. And this is what we found. So you're looking at a plot where we are looking at kidney cancer-specific survival. So at the beginning, 100% of the patients are alive. And this is time since surgery. And these are patients that present with localized kidney cancer, and we're going to see what happens to the patients over time. And this is what happens. So when we plot the life expectancy of patients that had cancers, that had a normal polybromo-1 gene and a normal BAP1 gene, we found that at 20 years, about 90% of the patients were alive. However, for those few patients whose cancers were deficient for both polybromo-1 and BAP1, none of the patients were alive. And we found that those patients that had tumors that were deficient for polybromo-1 did almost as well as those patients that had tumors that were competent for both polybromo-1 and BAP1, and those patients that had tumors that were deficient for BAP1 had an intermediate life expectancy. So we think this sets a foundation for a molecular characterization of cancer that impinges on prognosis. Interestingly enough, once again, when we look at these double mutant tumors, we found that the percentage of tumors that had mutations, the percentage observed, was um, significantly lower than the expected percentage based on the mutation frequency in the particular cohort. So our work, uh, indicates that kidney cancer can be divided into four different subtypes. We, the deadliness goes from little deadliness with uh, tumors that are competent for BAP1 and PRM1. We refer to these tumors as wild type and increases for the tumors that are deficient for both. And we are working to try to harness these defects so that we can identify new treatments for the future. So the conclusions for this part of the talk are that BAB1 and PRM1 mutations define four subtypes of kidney cancer with different biology and prognosis. We think that these, biology, these discoveries underlie the foundation for a molecular genetic classification of kidney cancer, uh, and we hope that they will pave the way for new treatments. We've done something similar in a less common form of kidney cancer, which is referred to as the non-clear cell renal cell carcinomas, which we, where we have also discovered other genes. And we have used this knowledge to generate the first genetically engineered mouse model of kidney cancer. So as it turns out, in contrast to humans, mice rarely develop kidney cancer. Can anybody tell me why that might be the case? That's exactly right. Chromosome three. Can you can you tell me why that might be the right answer? They don't have it. That could have been a good answer. So they actually so 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 mice do have BHL and do have BAB1 and PBRM1. But what could it be about chromosome three that is different in mice and humans? Exactly. That's the answer. Why don't you repeat it again? Uh, the genes are next to each other, so you don't lose the whole short arm. Lose all the genes. So in humans, all the genes are together in chromosome 3. In the mouse, they are on different chromosomes. So VHL is on one chromosome, BAB1 and PRM1 are on a different chromosome. So whereas in the human, you just lose one chromosome arm, and all of a sudden you've lost one copy of, in fact, four genes, but three genes that I've discussed with you today. In the mice, you can lose the same region, and you only lose one or you lose two genes. Now, that has broad implications, because it may explain why different species are predisposed to different cancers. 
right? So depending upon the arrangement of these tumor suppressor genes in chromosomes, you could have one species that is predisposed to one cancer type and another species that is predisposed to a different cancer type. So excellent answer. And we've also discovered a novel familial kidney cancer syndrome. So we found that BAB1 could be mutated, like I've described, in cells of the kidney, right? So those are the mutations that we are describing. So the normal cells have normal BAB1, but BAB1 gets altered and leads to kidney cancer. But we've also discovered that in some individuals, BAB1 is mutated in the sperm and the egg. So you have BAB1 mutations that go from generation to generation. So we had a family where there was predisposition to kidney cancer, and we found that the predisposition to kidney cancer was because there was a defect in BAB1. So now we have a test so that other members of that family can determine whether they do or they don't have the mutation. Based on the fact that I told you that there are two copies of BAB1, and only one is mutated, what's the frequency, you think, in the offspring of having kidney cancer predisposition? 50%. And that's actually typically the case for most cancer syndromes. So when there is a family uh, cancer, it's usually 50% of the individuals that are at risk. And finding the genetic defect is helpful because that way you can tell who is at risk and should be followed closely so that the cancer is detected early before it metastasizes and when it can be cured from the individual that doesn't have the mutation and doesn't need anything. So I've told you a little bit about personalized medicine, uh, the clinical trials, biomarkers, tumor modeling, drug identification, and molecular genetics. I gave you a little glimpse to, into some of those areas. And this program in the laboratory has been the basis for a kidney cancer program at UT Southwestern. And our goal is to build the best kidney cancer program anywhere. That's our lofty goal. So the kidney cancer program was inaugurated by Mayor Rawlings. Uh, and that was in December of 2013. It has a leadership representing many of the specialties at UT Southwestern, including Rick Bruick, who did very important work on this HIF2 protein and the development of this HIF2 inhibitor. Uh, we has a specialist from urology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology. We work together. It has, a, um, uh, I think, a prominent scientific advisory board uh, this gentleman over here, Carlos Artiaga, is the past president of the largest cancer research association in the U.S. This lady over here is the director of the Cancer Center at UPenn. This gentleman over here is the director of the Center for Personalized Medicine at the University of Chicago. These are all uh, important players in kidney cancer or other cancer types. We've made, we've developed, in fact, pioneer treatments so what you can see here is a patient who has a kidney cancer, in fact, my patient, and the kidney cancer is actually invading into this uh, conduit, which is the inferior vena cava. The vena cava brings the blood from the extremities and the rest of the organs back into the heart. You can see it bifurcates here to go into each leg. And this tumor is gotten inside the vena cava and is traveling. Sometimes it gets all the way to the heart. There are usually, the management for this is surgery, but there are some patients that cannot have surgery. And UT Southwestern is the first institution ever to try a stereotactic radiation and to show that this may be a treatment option for this type of patient. We also have a patient council. So we asked patients of our community to be part of our kidney cancer program so that they can help us and guide the, the kidney cancer program in ways to meet our objective of serving our community of kidney cancer patients. Uh, these are the members of our council, and in fact, I'm gonna show you at closure a video with Tony. So kidney cancer is, I told you, uh, not a very common cancer type, but at Simmons Cancer Center is in fact the fourth uh, most common tumor type that we see. There has been substantial growth in the kidney cancer program We've grown by 30% over the course of the last three years, and we hope to be delivering patients with the best possible care available. And the kidney cancer program has pioneered a number of different things in the Simmons Cancer Center. We pioneered a sport application. So there is one sport at UT Southwestern, which we've had for 15 years. So sports are specialized programs of research excellence. They are grants given by the National Cancer Institute 
uh, there are, in 2014, there were 51 sport grants. And uh, in the history of the program, there has only been one sport grant in kidney cancer, which is at the Harvard Cancer Center. So we put together an application. This application scored in the high impact range, but it was in the excellent bracket. We need to get to the outstanding bracket to be able to get funded, but we are close. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scope of the, of the project, it involves 30 faculty. There are four project leaders, four core directors, and we have a developmental research program and a career development program. It's more than 1,000 pages, which for scientists is a lot. We don't like to write. <laughs> and uh, to my knowledge, we may be one of possibly two institutions that were invited back to, to resume it with a competitive score. The kidney cancer program has also pioneered a platform for integrated tumor analysis. We've done this in 300 patients in collaboration with pharmaceutical company Genentech. We also have a large scale tumor graph program. We've in fact have had 700 patients who've given us specimens. And we've been able to generate 70 lines. We, have, we are pioneering an integrated database that links automatic entries from the medical record, research samples, imaging, genomics and tumor graphs. We, are, uh, we have a disease-focused patient council, and we started the first patient volunteer program of Simmons Cancer Center. Thank you.